Welcome to the Picademia course on the basics of semiconductors. This lecture covers the photo detectors. Let's start. By the time you finish this lesson, you will learn junction photo detectors, photoconductive detectors, ways to improve sensitivity of junction photo detectors, and the relationship between the light wavelength and photon energy. In the previous lecture, I discussed the light emitting diode or LED, and we saw when an LED is forward biased, a visible or invisible light could be emitted. We also saw that the wavelength of the light emitted by the LED was dependent on the band gap of the semiconductor. What is interesting is that there is a symmetry between an LED and a junction photo detector. What I mean by the symmetry is that the same LED that emits light when biased forwardly can detect incoming visible or invisible lights under the reverse bias. I have to point this out that the symmetry that I'm talking about is not about the materials we use to build a photo detector. In fact, for a photo detector, the semiconductor being direct or indirect is not of importance. What is important is choosing the right semiconductor that gives us a desired band gap. So back to the symmetry discussion. It is just about this interesting fact that an LED could be used as a photo detector. I'm dedicating this whole lecture to discuss the junction photo and photoconductive detectors. Since in the previous lecture I talked about LED, it makes more sense to start the discussion from the junction photo detector, not the photoconductive detector. Here I have a PN junction, and this is the biasing circuit for this PN junction. As I said, for a photo detector, it is not that important if the semiconductor is direct or indirect. But to have a more meaningful discussion, I assume that we are dealing with a direct semiconductor. So, if this PN junction is forwardly biased, it emits light. Let's uh, make it reverse bias to see what will happen. From the previous lectures, we all know that the depletion region of a PN junction reversely biased gets bigger than when uh, is unbiased or forwardly biased. In the depletion region, there is an electric field directed from the N side to the P side. Let me draw the energy band diagram associated to this reverse biased PN junction. This is going to be a very useful tool to explain the photo detection process. Now, let's expose the PN junction to a source of light. In this example, the light is emitted through the surface of the P semiconductor. Among all the photons hitting the surface of the P semiconductor, I grab one of them to simplify the discussion. If the photon energy is large enough, when it enters the semiconductor, it travels a distance in the device. The distance traveled depends on the photon energy. Let's say during its travel in the P semiconductor, the photon strikes an atom. As a result of this collision, the photon energy is transferred to the atom and a pair of charge carriers, a free electron and a hole is generated. In the energy band diagram, we can see how a free electron and a hole are generated. Due to the direction of the externally forced electric field, the free electron is propelled toward the edge of the depletion region. Once it gets within the diffusion length, it is sucked into the end semiconductor by the depletion region. Once the electron arrives, the end semiconductor, an electron near the ohmic contact of the end semiconductor, leaves the device. Therefore, an electric current is formed. Now, imagine that the photon is that energized that travels through the P semiconductor and also the depletion region and then enters the N semiconductor. Here is where the photon transfers its energy to an atom and as a result, a pair of free electrons and hole is generated. 
This is shown in the energy band diagram. Due to the direction of the electric field, the free electron cannot pass through the depletion region and go to the P semiconductor. However, the hole generated is propelled toward right by the externally forced electric field and sucked into the P semiconductor. Once the hole gets there, for the P semiconductor neutral region to remain neutral, an electron from the ohmic contact on the left side enters the device. This in fact creates an electric current. Under these two cases, only one charge carrier is responsible for current generation. The other scenario to talk about is when a photon strikes an atom in the depletion region and a free electron and a hole is generated. What do you think in, is the difference between this scenario and the two I just talked about? This is an amazing question. Think about it. Due to the electric field in the depletion region, the electron moves toward the N semiconductor and the hole moves toward the P semiconductor. When they arrive at their destinations, an electron leaves the device from the N side ohmic contact and an electron enters from the P ohmic contact. What we are observing here is that a photon incident hitting an atom in the depletion region is contributing in generation of two charge carriers that both contribute to current generation. In other words, we have some sort of gain here. One incident photon produces two current contributing charge carriers. Now, if I ask you about the conclusion you're making out of this discussion, what do you say? Think about it. If you want to have a more sensitive photo detector, you want to produce more electric current for every single incident photon enters the device, right? So it means that we want to widen the depletion region so as to increase the possibility of an incident photon collision to an atom in the depletion region. This statement takes us to the next question. How do we increase the depletion region width one way to do so is to increase the reverse voltage, but this method is not practical for two reasons. First, this may cause an avalanche breakdown. Second, the depletion region width does not increase to the desired degree. So what do we do? Is there any other technique we can employ to effectively widen the depletion region? Well, there is a simple technique and I introduced it in the previous lectures. We just need to use it. Here is the answer. In the previous lectures, we met the pin diode. In a pin diode, a light doped uh, N semiconductor symbolized by N minus is sandwiched between a P plus semiconductor and N plus semiconductor. Since the middle semiconductor is so lightly doped, it is traditionally called the intrinsic region. Here, I do not enter the details of the pin diode, especially that I covered this topic before. If you haven't watched that lecture, please go back, watch it, and come back to this lecture. Anyway, if the pin diode is well designed in the intrinsic region, a uniform or semi-uniform electric field forms, giving us a wide depletion region at which we could achieve high sensitivity in photo detection. In addition to the junction photo detectors, there is another type of photo detecting device called photoconductive detector. This device is made of only one type of semiconductor and do not have any junction. Here is an intrinsic silicon bulk connected to a voltage source. If I imagine that the environment temperature is 300 degrees Kelvin, the intrinsic charge carrier concentration is 10 to the power of 10th per centimeter cube. And therefore some current is flowing through the device. 
Due to the voltage source, um, there is an electric field directed from the positive to negative ohmic contacts. Here is the energy band diagram. Now, what I'm going to do is to place a light source on top of the semiconductor. So what happens next is that photons are emitted to the semiconductor. To make the discussion easier, I consider only the effect of one incident photon. If the energy of the incident photon entering the device is equal or larger than the silicon band gap, a pair of charge carriers, an electron and a hole is generated. The hole is propelled in the electric field direction and the electron is propelled in the opposite direction of the electric field. So, as you can see, when the semiconductor is exposed to a light source, its conductivity improves. A P-type or N-type semiconductor can also be used as a conductive photodetector. The advantage of an extrinsic semiconductor as a photodetector is that the dopant energy level ED is close to EB for the P-semiconductor and close to EC for the N-semiconductor. Therefore, the incident photons with smaller energies can ionize the dopant atoms. For the P-semiconductor, the ionization caused by an incident photon brings up an electron to the energy level ED from the balance band. And for the N-semiconductor, the ionization caused by an incident photon takes an electron from the energy level ED to the conduction band. Considering the electric field direction, the hole in the balance band in the P-semiconductor is uh, propelled in the direction of the electric field and the electron is propelled in the opposite direction of the electric field in the um, N semiconductor. What we need to pay attention to here is the temperature. If you remember the lecture at which I was discussing extrinsic semiconductors, we learned that at room temperature, extrins extrinsic semiconductors are normally designed in such a way that all their dopant atoms are ionized. Why is it important? Uh, this is important here because, let's say, at room temperature, all the dopant atoms of these two P-type and N-type semiconductors are ionized, and therefore incoming photons cannot ionize any dopant atoms. So what I want to conclude here is that the dopant atom must be carefully chosen in this particular case so that we can have a reliable conductive photodetecting device. So far, you have learned how junction and conductive photodetectors work, but you have not been introduced to the photon energy. Whatever I discussed so far about the photon energy was qualitative not quantitative. When I say if the photon is energized enough, it can cause this or that, what exactly that energy level is? A photon energy can be calculated using this very simple equation, 1.24 divided by lambda, the photon wavelength. The unit of lambda is micrometer. Now, if I'm talking about a pure silicon conductive photodetector, what type of light can cause the generation and finally photodetection? Here is part of the uh, electro electromagnetic uh, spectrum. The visible light is a tiny portion in this chart. The wavelength of the visible light spans from 0.4 micrometer to 0.7 micrometer. F of 0.7 micrometer, we have the infrared light and below 0.4 micrometer, we have the ultraviolet light electromagnetic waves. Let's use the equation and see for silicon with a band gap of around 1.1 electron volts, what wavelength of light will cause generation. The cutoff wavelength given by this equation for the pure silicon is 1.13 micrometer. Calculate this wavelength is larger than 0.7 micrometer, the red light, and Therefore, the photodetector is sensitive to infrared light. Let's do the calculation for germanium. The germanium band gap is around 0.67 electron volts, and therefore, 
The cutoff wavelength is 1.85 micrometer. Therefore, a germanium-based conductive photodetector is also sensitive to infrared light. Gallium nitride uh, band gap is around 3.4 electron volts at room temperature. Therefore, its uh, cutoff wavelength is 0.36 micrometer. This is the wavelength of the violet light, a little bit ultraviolet. So this photodetector is sensitive to the ultraviolet light, but not any light with a wavelength of more than 0.36 micrometer. All these examples are the simplest scenarios I could talk about. You may ask, what if I want to detect only a particular wavelength of light? Well, to do so, you may need to use compound semiconductors or dope semiconductors. But as far as I'm concerned in this course, uh, this level of understanding is enough. In this lecture, I discussed junction photodetectors, photoconductive detectors, ways to improve sensitivity of junction photodetectors, and the relationship between the light wavelength and photon energy. In the next lecture, I will cover solar cells. Thanks for joining this lecture of Picademia.